Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, and thank you so much for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and today is March 18th, and there are just two days until the first day of spring. And I like to say that spring is moving in on us as fast as Creeping Charlie in my garden. I hope that drew a smile because I worked on it all morning. Here's today's show. Today we celebrate the birthday of a man that many of us have heard about, but the details of his life story are even more compelling than the legend that is part of his legacy. We'll also learn about a gardener and a broadcaster who was beloved by millions and who started off his lifelong career as a gardener at Windsor Castle. We'll hear an excerpt today from one of my favorite meditation books on nature, and we grow that garden library with an oldie but goodie, a classic workbook on garden design. And then we'll wrap things up with the story of a philanthropic gardener who left her mark with her garden, her work at the New York Botanical Garden, and with her magnificent idea for a garden at the 1939 World's Fair. Now, before we get to all of that, and before we get to today's garden news, I just wanted to share something with you that I thought might be helpful. I don't know about where you live, but in Minnesota, depending on your county, you may get a flyer where you can purchase various trees and shrubs from your county. In fact, up here at the cabin, I received a very nice list of about 50 different trees, and it appears that the price for many of these is around $30. Now, I like to do this in an effort to support my county, but also there are times when the trees and shrubs that are on this list can be difficult to find. They might not be available in a garden center near me, so I generally order at least a couple of items From this list. Now, if you've already gotten some type of offer for trees and shrubs from your county, go ahead and do your homework. Give them a call, talk to them about the particular trees and shrubs that are available to you. Make sure you understand how you can get them. Because in my brochure, it says that if I don't pick these items up by the beginning of April, then I will forfeit my order. So you don't want that to happen. And also, you do want to understand exactly the size of those trees and shrubs and what kind of container they're growing in. It's time for today's Curated Garden News. Today's Curated Garden News was written by Sarah Raven, and the title of the article is Why the Chrysanthemum is Having a Comeback. Now, Sarah starts off her article this way. I knew things had changed with chrysanthemums when four years ago, I walked into the Brooklyn workshop of Saipua, the super trendy New York florist, and saw buckets and buckets of chrysanthemums, all in cadaverous tones. Every flower was in its own plastic hairnet to protect the twisty, complex, many-petaled heads. They cost a fortune and were destined for a flower installation at the Met. Well, as you can tell from that tiny little excerpt, Sarah is a magnificent writer. And if you are at all interested in growing cut flowers, you might want to jump on the bandwagon and grow more chrysanthemums this year. In fact, Sarah writes, if I had to choose one flower I want more of in 2021, it would be chrysanths. So keep that in mind when you're picking out your flower seeds or when you're at the garden center, chrysanthemums are in. And if you'd like to read this post for yourself over in the Facebook group for the show, you can do that very easily just by searching for the word chrysanthemum. And if that's too hard to spell, then search for the word comeback because that's also in the title of this post. 
why the chrysanthemum is having a comeback. Anyway, this is a wonderful little article, and I hope you check it out. If you are not in the Facebook group, don't worry about it. You can join at any time. You have a standing invitation. It is totally free, and it is a completely private group. So what you share in the group, for instance, if you share pictures of your garden, or if you comment on other people's posts, it can only be seen in the group. Now, how you join the group is very simple. The next time you're in Facebook, just type in Daily Gardener Community, where you'd search for a friend and then request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. It's time for today's botanical history. botanical history for today, March 18th. Today is the anniversary of the death of John Chapman, better known as Johnny Appleseed. He died on this day at the age of 70 on March 18th in 1845. Johnny was born in Massachusetts. In fact, the street where he was born is now called Johnny Appleseed Lane. As a young man, Johnny became an apprentice to an orchardist named Crawford, and the image that most of us have of Johnny traipsing through the country, planting one apple tree at a time, is sadly off base. That's not actually how things went for Johnny. He actually traipsed through the country, planting entire apple orchards. And then after he planted an orchard, he would protect the grove by building a fence around it. And then he'd arrange a deal with a neighboring farmer to sell trees from the orchard in exchange for shares. It was a genius setup. And every time I think of a community garden or hear about a school or a city that rejects a community garden, I always think of Johnny's ingenuity because he knew how to overcome that objection of who's going to take care of this garden. And he incentivized people to do just that. Now, during his life, Johnny had a particular regard for and relationship with Native Americans who regarded Johnny as a medicine man. At the same time, Johnny wanted early American settlers to succeed, and he often acted as a one-man welcome wagon. He'd often show up at the door of a family who had just settled in the area, and he'd give them a gift of herbs— as a gesture of welcome. And most people are surprised to learn that Johnny was an expert in more plants than just apple trees. In fact, he was one of our country's first naturalists and herbalists. And Johnny regularly used many herbs for healing, such as catnip, whorehound, pennyroyal, rattlesnake weed, and dog fennel. In fact, dog fennel, or eupatorium, was also called Johnny weed because Johnny planted it, believing it was anti-malarial. Now, whenever I hear the word eupatorium, I always think Joe Pye weed. That is a plant that is closely related to eupatorium or dog fennel. And like the dog fennel, it is a prolific spreader in the garden. Now, unfortunately, dog fennel is not something you want in your garden, as it is a noxious weed. Now, today, the Johnny Appleseed Center is located on the campus of Urbana University in Urbana, Ohio, and it holds the most extensive collection of memorabilia and information on Johnny Appleseed. And in 1999, seedlings from the last known surviving Johnny Appleseed tree were transplanted into the courtyard around the museum. Now, I thought I would end this little segment on Johnny Appleseed by sharing with you some fun apple facts. First, the crab apple is the only apple that's actually native to North America. 
A medium apple is about 80 calories, and apples are fat, sodium, and cholesterol-free. And the old saying, an apple a day keeps the doctor away, is actually from an old English adage that went like this. To eat an apple before going to bed will make the doctor beg for his bread. Apples are a member of the rose family, and the science of apple growing is called pomology. And apples come in all shades of reds, greens, and yellows. Now, in terms of photosynthesis, it takes the energy of 50 leaves to produce a single apple. And back in 1647, America's longest-lived apple tree was planted by Peter Stuyvesant in his Manhattan orchard. It was still bearing fruit when a derailed train struck it in 1866. And finally, here's my favorite little-known fact about apples. Back in colonial times, an apple was known by two charming common names, the winter banana and melt in the mouth. Who knew? And today is the anniversary of the death of the British gardener, broadcaster, and writer Percy Thrower who died on this day, March 18th in 1988. As a young boy, Percy wanted to grow up to be a head gardener just like his father. And after spending his entire childhood learning from his dad, he became a journeyman gardener at Windsor Castle at the age of 18. Along with 20 other gardeners, Percy worked at Windsor for five years, and he eventually married the daughter of the head gardener, Charles Cook. And by the time Percy and Connie Cook were married, he was working for Queen Mary as the head gardener at Sandringham, and in honor of his wedding, Queen Mary gifted the couple a beautiful set of china. Now, during World War II, Percy became a major voice for the Dig for Victory campaign. He put on educational seminars at the local parks, and he spent hours working as a volunteer. And in 1946, at the tender age of 32, he was made the parks superintendent of Shrewsbury. This was a watershed event. Percy was the youngest parks superintendent in the history of England. Now, this was a big job. He had a staff of about 35 gardeners to manage. And while most people thought he would stay in position for only about four or five years, he actually ended up holding this post for almost 30 years. It was during his time at Shrewsbury that he made his very first television appearance. And of course, during the episode, he featured his garden. And this appearance led to a long career in television and broadcasting for Percy. In fact, the great Alan Titchmarsh credits Percy with inspiring him to pursue gardening. Now, sadly, toward the end of Percy's career, he was dropped by the BBC after agreeing to do some commercials for a group called Plant Protection. The move marked a milestone for Percy, and it was bittersweet. And he later recalled that his deal with Plant Protection was the best contract he'd ever signed. Toward the end of his life, Percy began taking people on tours of European gardens, and he even established the Percy Thrower Floral Tours Company. And when he wasn't taking people on trips to Europe, he spent his time showing English gardens on the weekends. And it was on one of these trips that Percy's health took a turn for the worse. 
He was diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease, and he made his final recording from the hospital a week before he died on this day, March 18th in 1988. And I thought you'd enjoy hearing this one little story that I came across in researching Percy's life. When he was first working at Windsor Castle, he found 50 old fuchsias in the greenhouses. And seeing those fuchsias gave him an idea. He decided to propagate them, and he took cuttings from the tips of the first rootings, and then he began to even root side shoots. Well, the net result was Percy had over 5,000 new fuchsias to plant around Windsor Castle. And I bet that was something to see. It's time for today's Unearthed Words. Today's Unearthed Words come to us from William Ashworth from his book, The Left Hand of Eden. The subtitle for this book is Meditations on Nature and Human Nature. It's just a short little thing, about 187 pages, but it's really a wonderful book. So if you're looking for a book of meditation, consider The Left Hand of Eden. And here's an excerpt from the prologue. The word nature comes down to us from the Latin natura. It is derived from natus, birth. And in its original usage, it simply meant physical kinship, the innate characteristics and traits shared among family members as a result of their common genetic heritage. We use this sense of the word today when we refer to human nature or to the nature of things. But natura was also used in Latin to differentiate the natural world, the world of born, from the manufactured world, the world of made. And it is the twist we have given to this alternative meaning that has gotten us into trouble. For the Romans, the second meaning was a logical extension of the first. For us, it has become a separation between two radically different types of reality, the works of God on one hand and the works of technology on the other. We look at our cities and our automobiles and our computers and our TV dinners and think we have created something. We have not. All we have done is used pre-created rules to put pre-created things together in new ways. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, Garden Design Workbook by John Brooks. This book came out in 1994, and the subtitle is A Practical Step-by-Step Course. Well, this book is a garden classic. It's an oldie but goodie. And if you're just starting out in garden design, this is really a book that you should have. John is really a master designer, and in his book, he includes many helpful hints and instructions for creating practical designs for your own garden. And way back in the early 2000s, I first bought this book when I became interested in landscape design. So my copy is dog-eared and all marked up. And it's a little bit of a trip down memory lane when I flip through the pages. This book is 72 pages of learning how to design a garden, including learning how to draw a garden and learning the basic principles of structure. If you want to learn how to draw designs for your garden, then John's book is exactly what you're looking for. 
You can get a copy of Garden Design Workbook and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $1.25. That's a steal. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. It was on this day, March 18th in 1969, that the philanthropist and gardener Harriet Barnes Pratt died. Harriet had married Charles Pratt, who was the son of the founder of the Pratt Institute and also a founder of Standard Oil, which became Exxon. Now, Harriet and Charles had a beautiful estate in Glen Cove, Long Island. During their free time, the two worked together to install and design their gardens. Charles would site the locations, and Harriet would design the gardens and select the plants. The Pratts called their garden Wellwyn, and it was important to them to have continuous bloom throughout the growing season. And in this regard, they often referenced something that Sir Francis Bacon had said, that there ought to be gardens for all the months of the year. Now, Harriet did tremendous work with the New York Botanical Garden, and she spearheaded many initiatives like a beautiful flower show in the museum building back in 1915. But in terms of her horticultural achievements, Harriet is remembered for coming up with the idea for Gardens on Parade, a half-acre stunning display for the 1939 World's Fair. In addition to pulling together the 50 gardens that made up Gardens on Parade, Harriet led the effort to secure funding for this magnificent exhibition. Now, in today's show notes and over on the Facebook group for the show, I've included a link to a website that includes many, many photos of Harriet's beautiful Gardens on Parade, which was described in the Herald Tribune at the time as the most stupendous, most magnificent, most gorgeous exhibition of flowers, shrubs, and other horticultural beauties ever assembled. And today, there are many wonderful quotes from people who had the honor and the privilege of viewing Harriet's Gardens on Parade. One person raved, I visited the Gardens on Parade at the New York World's Fair this morning. They are delightful. Mrs. Harold Pratt and all the other ladies connected with the gardens were very charming. And they sent me away with a sweet little corsage of carnations, which gave off the most delicate perfume all the way back to Washington. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. Hey, thanks for spending part of your day with The Daily Gardener. If you want to read even more botanical brevities, just head on over to thedailygardener.org. That's where you can find all the stories, biographies, and books that I share on the show. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. It has lots of goodies in it, and I try to make the newsletter like you're getting a marvelous letter from a garden friend. You can always find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media. You can follow the show on Twitter and you have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for listeners of the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. Last but not least, you can easily share your gardener greetings or book submissions by emailing me at jennifer at the dailygardener.org. The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely Maple Grove in Wyoming, Minnesota, with the help of Paige Mance, Brooke Beerbaum, and Eric Begay. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow.